Uh, hi, uh, my name is Eleanor Lutz, um, and I like to use art and data visualization uh, to try and take scientific topics and share them with the general public. So my most recent project was a series of uh, about 10 different maps of astronomy data uh, taken from open sources like NASA and the USGS. So I'd like to talk a little about uh, some of the things I learned from making these maps um, and then some of the design decisions behind each one. So to give you a bit of background, uh, when I share these maps, um, all of the code is open sourced on GitHub with tutorials uh, so that anybody who wants can make the maps themselves. Uh, I also have the maps available as posters and the people who tend to generally use them are people who have young kids um, or our teachers in classrooms. So that's really the kind of audience that I'm designing for. This first map uh, shows the orbit paths of about 18,000 asteroids in the solar system. So this map was um, probably the most difficult one for me because I needed to pull together data from about five different open data sources and put them together. And the, the question I really tried to answer while making this map was, uh, what was the, the general message I wanted to get across to these children um, or the general public? And for me, uh, what was the most awesome thing about this data was uh, just that there are so many asteroids all over the solar system. Um, and I'm not actually a space scientist, so this is something that was really surprising to me. So I decided to use design decisions uh, that would really emphasize that point. So for example, I'm showing you all of the orbits here on a logarithmic scale, uh, with most of the map focused on the first billion kilometers from the sun. Uh, and this was a design choice that let me include everything to the boundaries of the solar system, uh, but still leave enough space to see um, just how many asteroids are in the inner areas. OK, um, so for other projects, uh, I had to do much less uh, data wrangling. So this is a geologic map of Mars. Uh, some of you might recognize the data from the USGS map, um, which basically had all the data I'm showing here uh, already laid out and organized. The main uh, design choices I did here was really to work with the language in the map. Um, the original map was, uh, I think, intended for scientific audiences, so the labeling and the colors um, were very difficult to understand, uh, especially for young audiences. So in the bottom here, I've really shortened all the descriptions uh, and tried to use vocabulary that everybody could understand. Um, I also changed the colors of the map. Uh, so here's a zoomed in version. I've decided to really emphasize the volcanic geologic region, so I'm making them a really bright red. Uh, and then also to emphasize the difference between the northern and southern hemispheres by picking slightly different color schemes. So I want to point out that sometimes these design decisions don't necessarily make the map uh, more legible. I think some of the volcanic regions in particular uh, can be a little hard to read. But because these maps weren't for a scientific purpose, um, I could make design decisions that were uh, a little more creative and that emphasized uh, the volcanoes or these other features of the planet. Uh, sometimes um, I needed to do a little more simplification of the data um, to have the data fit and look well at the size that I was going for. So this is a geologic map of the moon. Uh, the difficulty here was that because the data for the moon was much more detailed, um, the geologic features were a lot finer and many of them couldn't actually be seen uh, at the scale that I was showing at these posters, these poster size. So when I went through the data, I, I realized that many of the smaller um, geologic features uh, were actually different ages of the same material. Um, and this was causing a lot of noise in areas that had been uh, sampled many times. Uh, so 
what I decided to do for this map um, was to simplify it to a level where you could see individual geologic features. So this map doesn't actually include the different ages of the material. It's combined um, the material, the same type of geologic material for many different um, ages. I also had to uh, combine, I think, six different data sets uh, for this moon geology map. Um, you can actually see the boundaries here where some of the data sources don't agree with each other. Um, so that was a part where, uh, in the previous map, I also decided to um, include the different data sources as a reference for why those differences existed. OK, I also designed a series of topographic maps uh, of the rocky planets and the moon. So for these maps, I used a digital elevation model from the USGS, uh, as well as a database of names um, that I could download and plot onto each of these maps in Python. So one of the challenges of making topographic maps for space um, was that I found it was very difficult to kind of understand the scale of the planet because there were no oceans or other large differences um, in, the, uh, in the surface. So what I tried to do with these maps um, is use a color scale uh, that was very variable from the, the lowest parts here in navy uh, to the highest parts of the planet in orange and yellow. And making these uh, double color decisions for each of the planets, uh, I think, really helped emphasize the scale of the planet um, by adding a little more interest and by helping differentiate between the different elevations. Um, I also made uh, a map of the Earth. Um, so if you look at this online, it's actually animated so that each of the frames shows the Arctic ice for that particular uh, month of the year. And this is using blue marble data from NASA. OK. And uh, this final set of maps I want to talk about um, is a map of the constellations as seen from Earth. So this was one of my favorite maps to work on um, because there's just a huge amount of data available. Uh, here, I've already limited the data I'm showing to the 8,000 or so stars you can actually see from Earth. But there's still a lot of data, a lot of information about the size of the stars, um, and as well as the constellations and the names of each star. So this map is actually part of a series. Um, so here is just the, the, you know, the scientific data without the labels um, and the lines uh, that people have added. Um, and what I realized here was that um, these constellations um, come from many different cultures. So here I'm showing you the same stars um, but in this map, I'm showing also the constellations from about 30 different cultures or civilizations from around the world. Uh, each color here is uh, data from a different culture. Uh, this is from an open uh, database called Stellarium. And uh, what I really like about this map is that uh, even though it's kind of a tangled mess of lines, you can see that some stars are really popular, um, the ones uh, the large ones circled with large um, outlines are the most popular. Uh, but some constellations are also very unique. Um, so the stars outlined in um, an outline with just one culture's color is not used by any other culture in this database. So I really enjoyed this project in particular uh, because I was able to combine scientific data uh, from this large star database uh, with cultural data uh, and kind of the human history of uh, how we've been looking at stars and working with astronomy for many uh, hundreds and thousands of years. So um, as I said, again, all of this code is available open source. Um, please feel free to find me afterwards if you're interested in learning more about the project. Um, and thank you so much for everyone for listening and for NASA and AGU for letting me come here.